Today I'll be doing a quick review on some main topics that you will normally need to know during your first week of anatomy and physiology class. If you're on your first or second chapter of your textbook, then chances are I'll be covering that exact same material. And this is specifically for nursing or pre-nursing students. In other words, I'll be focusing on things you might be tested on as a nurse and emphasize on concepts that you will need to know throughout nursing school and kind of let you know the topics that you probably will only need to know to pass your A&P exams. If you're not a nursing student, this might still be great review for you, so you might want to just stick around. If you do stick around till the end, please give my video a thumbs up and let me know what you think in the comments below. Alrighty, let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about the differences between anatomy and physiology. Anatomy, I like to say, answers the questions what and where, while physiology answers the questions how and why. So, for example, if we're talking about the muscles, anatomy is going to tell you where these muscles are located and what they're attached to, while physiology is going to tell you how these muscles contract and how they produce movement. Physiology uses biology, physics, chemistry to answer these questions. And together, the goal of anatomy and physiology is basically to understand how the body responds to stimulus and how it maintains homeostasis. So down here in green, I have some of the common diagnostic tools that we use. Let's start with an x-ray. X-ray, if you've ever had a broken bone, then you probably have had an x-ray done on you. It's very common, and one word associated with an x-ray is a radiograph. A radiograph is basically the image that is produced from the x-ray. The next one is an ultrasound, and ultrasounds, we usually associate it with visualizing the fetus. However, you can use it for much more than that. Usually we use it for looking at blood clots, blood circulation, inflammation in the joints, looking at gallbladder disease. And one word that is associated with ultrasound is a sonogram. So the sonogram is the, the picture that is produced from the ultrasound. Next we have the CT scan. And TC scan is basically that big tube that gives you a 360 view of the body and normally you'll see this in the trauma department of a hospital because it's known to be quick and effective so it's really good to use in trauma department so for example if you have somebody coming in from a car wreck you might hear the doctor order a CT scan the next one is a DSA and this is used to isolate and visualize the blood vessels. We normally use this on a procedure called an angioplasty. So a DSA can look at anything in the cardiovascular system that includes the heart, the blood vessels, and the arteries, but mostly you're going to see it used in visualizing blood vessels in the brain. The next one is an MRI and this is commonly used to detect certain types of cancers because it's really good at visualizing tumors. And the last one is a PET. This is very specific in the way that it identifies metabolic states in different types of tissues. So once you get a better understanding of what metabolism is, you'll probably understand this a little bit better. But it's commonly used to analyze the brain. Moving on here, at the top I have written down anatomical positions, however that was a mistake. I actually meant to write directional terms because as you can see here I have all of the common directional terms written down and these you're going to want to memorize as soon as possible because more than likely you're going to be quizzed or tested on them and you're also going to need them for your first dissection lab I'm sure. And speaking of anatomical position, we know that that's a specific stance and we're always assuming that when we're talking about directional terms, the body is assumed to be in an anatomical position. Whether the body is in supine position, which means it's lying facing up, as you can see here, it's still an anatomical position, or whether it is prone, lying facing down, still an anatomical position. Um, this means that the body is upright, it's facing forward, the feet are flat, the limbs are to the side of the body, and the palms are facing forward, as you can see. And I like to think of this whole thing like a map. It's kind of like you know in a map that north is north, south is south, and etc. So when you're in anatomical position, 
you know that these are the directional terms. Now there are uh, two more that I'd like to include in here and those are on the next page. So let's look at that. So on the bottom right here in pink, I have the two directional terms that I was missing. Those would be contralateral and epsilateral. Contralateral means the opposite side of the body. So an example of that would be the left arm is contralateral to the right leg. And epsilateral means same side of the body. An example of that would be the right arm is epsilateral to the right leg. So up here on the right in red I have the planes. The planes are basically different cuts that you can do to look at different views of the body. Starting with the frontal, otherwise known as the coronal plane. This cuts the body into anterior and posterior views. Sagittal cuts the body into right and left halves and transversal cuts the body into superior and inferior views. Moving on to the abdominal area, you can describe the abdominal area in a few different ways. The most simplest way is you can describe it with quadrants. We have four quadrants, the right upper, left upper, right lower, and left lower. And below that you can see the nine regions. So when you're describing the abdominal area, you want to be as specific as you can because we have a lot of organs there and some even overlapping others. So for example, if you have a patient who comes in with stomach pain and they point it out, you might say in your notes that or communicate with another nurse or doctor that this person has pain in the right lower and left lower quadrant or if you wanted to be more specific, you could say this person has pain in the right iliac region and left iliac region. But the point is, you just want to be as specific as you can. Let's go ahead and move on to the body cavities. This can get a little bit messy because there are a lot of cavities and cavities within cavities. So just try to stay a bit organized in the way that you write these down. We're going to start off um, with the two major body cavities. There's one in the back of your body, and that's the dorsal cavity. And there's one in the front of your body, that's the ventral cavity. Let's go ahead and start with the dorsal cavity because that's the easiest one. Within the dorsal cavity, you also have the cranial cavity, which encloses the brain, and the spinal cavity, which encloses the spine. In the ventral cavity, you have two major sub cavities, one being the thoracic cavity and the other being the abdominal pelvic cavity. Within the thoracic cavity, you also have the superior, superior mediastinum, which divides the thoracic cavity into right and left parts. You have your pleural cavity, which encloses the lungs, and you have your pericardial cavity, which encloses the heart. Now, I forgot to add the pericardial cavity here on this uh, diagram. So if you wanted to just add it right below pleural cavity, again that's pericardial cavity and it encloses the heart. And then below that I have the diaphragm, but the diaphragm is actually just a muscle that separates the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavity. It's technically not within one cavity or another, it just separates the two. And again that's a muscle. The other cavity is the abdominal pelvic cavity. Um, technically, these are not physically separate, but we can describe them as either the abdominal cavity or pelvic cavity, or we can just combine them together since they're not technically physically separate. separate. So let's move on to the serous membranes. We know that membranes is just another word for tissues, and we have two types of serous membrane, one being the visceral, and this is always going to be found closer to the organ. Um, more than likely, it's going to be wrapping around the organ and protecting and lubricating it. The next one is the parietal. This is going to be found a bit further away from the organ. So we find these serous membranes in body cavities. Let's go ahead and use the ones that we just learned. Uh, in the pericardial cavity, remember that's the one that's surrounding the heart, we're going to find the visceral and parietal pericardium. In the pleural cavity, this one is surrounding the lungs, we're going to find the visceral and parietal pleura. And in the peritoneal cavity, which is inside the abdominal area, we're going to find the visceral and parietal peritoneum. 
So as you can see, you're going to find visceral and parietal serous membranes in all of these cavities. However, they all have different names depending on which cavity they're located in. Uh, again, the pericardial, you're going to refer, it, refer to it as pericardium. Pleural cavity, you're going to refer to it as pleura. And peritoneal cavity, you're going to refer to it as peritoneum. So next we have the mesenteries and retroperitoneal, which are both found inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. These are both very similar but have one major difference. Uh, starting with the mesenteries, these are specialized membranes that anchor organs to the body wall, and they provide a pathway for nerves, blood vessels, lymphatics, and they also store fat. Some organs are closely attached to the body wall, so they don't really need the pathway to blood vessels, nerves, lymphatics, etc. that mesenteries might provide them. So instead, they have something called retroperitonea, and these organs are kidneys, adrenal glands, pancreas, parts of the intestine, and the urinary bladder. So I have a couple images here to show you the mesenteries. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an image of the retroperitonea. However, you will find the mesenteries more on the posterior side or the back side of the abdominal cavity. You can kind of see them more towards the spine and the anterior um, part is more towards the front of the belly, right? The opposite of the spine. That's where you will find the retroperitoneal. And the second image is a more realistic view of a dissection. You can clearly see your mesenteries are this mesh-like fiber that connects your organs together. Let's go ahead and switch the subject a bit and talk about the six essential characteristics for life. These are basically everything that defines living things. And I'd like to go down the list one by one and just get a general sense of each of these. Okay, let's begin with organization. This is basically an interrelationship between parts of your body, how they communicate with each other, and how they each perform specific functions. Number two is metabolism, and when it comes down to it, this basically just means chemical reactions inside of your body. Three is responsiveness. This is the ability to sense changes in the environment and to adjust to them. Number four is growth, and this refers to an increase of size or number of cells. Number five is development, and this means a change in an organ that an organism goes through from fertilization to death. Now, I'd like to emphasize fertilization because a lot of people think that development starts when a baby is born. However, it actually starts way before then when the when um, fertilization begins. And of course, it ends uh, with death. So number six is reproduction. And this just means the formation of new cells or new organisms. In our case, uh, as humans, it would be new organisms. OK, so next we have the six levels of organization, starting off with the most basic level, the chemical level, and ending with the most complex level, the organism level. So this is much like the last. Um, subject that we learn the six essential characteristics for life but unlike that one you're not only just going to have to memorize this information but you're going to have to gain a general understanding of it and um, keep it with you because this is something that is going to help you all throughout nursing school. Okay so starting off with the chemical level this is basically interactions between atoms and them forming molecules Secondly, we have the cellu cellular level, which is just cells. Number three, we have the tissue level, and we know that tissue is just intercellular structures. Um, they're basically made by a bunch of cells, uh, similar cells. Number four is organ level. Organs are composed of two or more types of tissue that perform one or more functions. For example, the heart or the lungs. Number five is an organ system, and this is a group of organs that perform a common function. So for example, you can have the gastrointestinal system or the cardiovascular system. Number six is an organism level, and this is any living thing considered a whole. So it could be made of trillions of cells like a human, or it could be made of one cell like a bacteria.
Alrighty guys, let's go ahead and jump into our very last topic of the video. This is going to be on homeostasis and how it relates to negative and positive feedback. So first off, we know that everything living must have homeostasis in order to thrive. And our bodies maintain homeostasis by using negative and positive feedback. So negative feedback returns a variable back to normal range, while positive feedback exaggerates the variable even further. Some common variables are heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, electrolyte concentration, and blood sugar. So let's start with an example of negative feedback. Let's just say you have too much sugar in your blood. What's going to happen is negative feedback is going to cause your pancreas to release more insulin, therefore lowering your blood sugar back within normal ranges. So here's a good example of positive feedback. Let's just take uterine contractions during childbirth. Uterine contraction is that variable that is already exaggerated. It's not within normal range, right? Because normal would be not having any uterine contractions at all. That would be normal, right? But during childbirth, they are exaggerated even further because positive feedback um, it's going to cause oxytocin to be exaggerated and released and make even more contractions. More contractions until uh, the birth of the baby. So as you can see, it's already in a variable that is already exaggerated and positive feedback is just going to go ahead and amplify it. It's just going to go ahead and exaggerate it even further. And so as you can see in childbirth, positive feedback can actually be a good thing. Okay, so as you can see, some positive feedback can be a good thing, and many diseases actually result from negative feedback failure. So that's super important. That's one of those high-yield exam questions that you should know. And I just wanted to add one last thing, and that is talking about feedback mechanism and feedback loop. So a lot of people get these mixed up and think they're the same thing because they have the word feedback in them. But if you really think about it, feedback mechanism is actually a circle of communication within your body that maintains homeostasis, okay? And feedback loop is actually a circle of communication that returns to the beginning to verify correct results, okay? So that's super important. They're two completely different things. And I just wanted to make sure to point that out. Hey guys, you made it to the end of the video. Thanks so much for sticking around. If you have any feedback you'd like to let me know, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. Other than that, please give me a thumbs up if you like this video or if you learned something new here. Um, this is my very first video on YouTube, so the next one I promise will be a lot smoother and more improved. And also, I will be uploading more content related to nursing like reviews. So if you like this video, go ahead and subscribe and stay tuned for more. And thank you so much again for watching.